Our opening words come from the German novelist Nina George in her novel called The Little Paris Bookshop. First words that connect to this time of year, which we now call Halloween, but has ancient roots in the pagan observation of Samhain, the time of year when the veil between the worlds is thin. What task do the departed want us to do? The novelist asks. To carry them within us, that is our task. We carry them all inside us, all our dead and shattered loves. Only they make us whole. If we begin to forget or cast aside those we've lost, then, then we are no longer present either. All the love, all the dead, all the people we've known, they are the rivers that feed our sea of souls. If we refuse to remember them, that sea will dry up too. And then from the same novel, some words that connect to this month's theme of democracy. I'm a firm believer that you have to taste a country's soul to understand it and to grasp its people. And by soul, I mean what grows there, what its people see and smell and touch every day, what travels through them and shapes them from the inside out. We have been pondering democracy this past month, and today we're looking at the spirit underneath it, and in some cases, the religious values. These words come from Mozi who was a Taoist philosopher centuries ago. When all the people of the world love, then the strong will not overpower the weak, the many will not oppress the few, the wealthy will not mock the poor, the honored will not disdain the humble, and the cunning will not deceive the simple. So this reading comes from the Haudenosaunee Iroquois Confederacy called the Great Law of Peace. The Iroquois Confederacy arose centuries ago among separate warring communities as a way to create harmony, unity, and respect among human beings. Implicit is commitment to the highest principles of human liberty. Iroquois law's recognition of individual liberty and justice surpasses any European parallel. Faith keeper Oren Lyons in Onondaga states the great law of peace includes freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and the right of women to participate in government. Separation of power in government and checks and balances within government are traceable to our Iroquois constitution, ideas learned by colonists. The central idea underlying Iroquois political philosophy is that peace is the will of the creator and the ultimate spiritual goal and natural order among humans. The principles of Iroquois government embodied in the great law of peace were transmitted by a historical figure called the peacemaker. His teachings emphasize the power of reason to assure righteousness, justice, and health among humans. Peace came to the Iroquois not through war and conquest, but through the exercise of reason guided by the spiritual mind. The Iroquois League is based not on force of arms or rule of law, but spiritual concepts of natural law applied to human society. At the planting of a tree of peace in Philadelphia in 1986, Mohawk chief Jake Swamp explained, in the beginning when our creator made humans, everything needed to survive was provided. Our creator asked only one thing, never forget to appreciate the gifts of Mother Earth, our people were instructed how to be grateful and how to survive. But during a dark age in our history 1,000 years ago, humans no longer listened to the original instructions. Our creator became sad because there was so much crime, dishonesty, injustice, and war. So creator sent a peacemaker with a message to be righteous and just and make a good future for our children seven generations to come. He called all warring people together and told them as long as there was killing, there would be no peace of mind. There must be a concerted effort by humans for peace to prevail. Through logic, reasoning, and spiritual means, he inspired the warriors to bury their weapons and planted atop a sacred tree of peace. Again, that's from the Haudenosaunee Iroquois Confederacy. Thank you very much, John. John will be back with us in a little while. It's, uh, this isn't a full sermon. We're going to have a congregational conversation, and John is so good at leading those, I'm going to invite him to do it. 
About a week ago, I attended a dinner gathering of folks not associated with our church. Now, most of this crowd were socially moderate or liberal and economically moderate or conservative. Most. There was this one fellow. At some point, after a bit of wine had flowed, uh, things turned to the civic election and the UCP leadership race and quickly expanded to all government forms. This man was easily the most conservative in the room. He even admires the American president. His views were the anti-government interference of the, uh, sorry, his views were the anti-government interference wishes of small businessmen. He thought government basically existed to make his life more difficult. So you can guess his speech. Iverson is spending us into the ground with his stupid mass transit ideas and the projects that aren't coming in on time and they're over budget and don't get me started on the bike lanes. Notley is ruining the province with their socialist deficits, and Trudeau is stealing Alberta's money through the transfer payments. These crazy socialists are destroying the country. Nobody likes us. We are on our own, and we have to get rid of a lot of them and install someone who will save our Alberta dollars. I'm sure you get the drift. Well, everyone is entitled to their point of view. But what struck me as relevant to this discussion on democracy was how the man would not even listen to a differing opinion. I was struck by the first hymn, May all who seek here find a kindly word. May all who speak here feel they have been heard. The rest of the dinner company did not feel that they were heard. Once he had the floor, he worked to dominate the conversation. Discussion was not welcome. Several of us, for he offended even the moderates, politely tried to challenge his views with silly, frivolous things like, you know, facts. His understanding of transfer payments was completely wrong, for example. However, facts did not matter in this discussion. He knew what he knew, and he wasn't going to relent until we agreed. Instead, most of us just kind of drifted away from the conversation, people like me being particularly grateful that we were at the other end of the table and could drift off first. No one really wanted to start a fight. It is a dinner conversation, after all. And I doubt that to this moment he knows that he lost a lot more than a political debate that night. Ms. Notley might want to send him a thank you note for increasing her support. What made me sad was not that our political views didn't mesh. What bothered me was that the common good did not matter to this man. It did not even factor into his thinking. His priorities were his wealth and his business and his family's well-being, in that order, I think. Any policy that did not serve those goals was to be decried, dismissed, and done away with as soon as possible. And what the majority might need, what might benefit the city and the country the most, had no value to him. He could not see beyond his own need and his own desire. The idea of sacrificing a little bit for the good of all made no sense to him. And if I'd said something about unto the seventh generation, he probably would have looked at me like I was a Martian. This man lives in a democracy, but he does not understand it. He has no sense of the underlying spirit that makes democracy possible and makes it successful when it is successful. Now, during this series, I've touched on the links between religion and democracy, especially our liberal religion and democracy. I've quoted our statement of principles, which explicitly include the use of the democratic process. I looked at the ideas of the Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams. He argued that democracy is best created in small groups, in local voluntary associations where decisions bubble upwards, not downwards. I've also discussed the new trend of cities rising as key political players in our country and in the world. Cities are the place, I said several times, where things actually get done and where services are actually delivered. 
But what I have not really noted explicitly is that democracy depends on a living spirit that keeps it alive. An internal and integrated understanding of the principles that make democracy a useful political form. It's more than a decision-making tool or a form of government. It is a philosophy. It is a worldview. And in some sense, it's also a spiritual discipline. Now, that last comment might seem absurd, especially for those of us who grew up in a culturally Christian country. After all, Christianity historically has been the most hierarchical religious structure of all, with power trickling down from God through the divine right of kings and popes and so on. But even in the most structured and authoritarian societies, the king, bishop, dictator relies in some way on the consent of the governed. In feudal times, no king could wage war unless the lords literally ponied up the knights and the wealth to make the war possible. In spite of the proclaimed papal authority, the Catholic Church was a place of great political intrigue for several centuries, and a pope who did not have the support of the powerful cardinals did not succeed, and sometimes did not live very long either. Even the harshest dictator who relies on fear and strength to keep the people cowed also depends on the generals. And if the generals don't want to keep them around, that dictator is not going to have a long regime. Without some degree of consent of the governed, no regime succeeds for very long. Now, a key principle of democracy is that the governed give their explicit consent through voting and through accepting the laws the government proposes. I cannot possibly remember where the reference was, but you know those things that make you go, I never thought of that. Someone turned to me one day and said, how long would the government last if the entire nation refused to pay taxes? Hmm. In every land, in every political structure, people long for peace, for fairly simple lives, and for fairness. They wish to live free, free of fear, with the freedom to pursue a reasonable amount of happiness. And preserving those fundamental needs is the core of the democratic spirit. Now we see this spirit reflected in most religions, even the hierarchically structured ones. Judaism, as I've said many times, is a religion of covenants. I will be your God and you will be my people. Even God depends on the consent of the people. Islam, in its uncorrupted form, is a completely egalitarian faith. Buddhism is the same in its roots. The Baha'i teacher, Greg Hodges, describes spiritual democracy from that faith's perspective. Aside from any discussion of what form of government works best for a given society, there is a broader question of how the generality of a population can take charge of its own development. On this topic, a broad Baha'i vision of democracy emerges. It does not necessarily involve a reinterpretation of existing democratic traditions. Rather, a Baha'i perspective on social and spiritual transformation contains at its core a vision of the people exercising influence over their own affairs. One could justifiably call this concept spiritual democracy. Earlier, we heard John share a reading from the Haudenosaunee Iroquois tradition. And they argued that their ideas had an influence on the founding fathers of the United States when they were setting up their government. Now, I haven't been able to test that claim as thoroughly as I would like, and I certainly know many historians point to the eruption of democratic principles in Europe at the time that the American Revolution was being founded. But nevertheless, the parallels are striking and must have had some degree of influence. The Center for Spiritual Democracy, which is also an Iroquois organization, offers this thought. The model for spiritual democracy contains the following three elements. They were referred to earlier. One, 
balanced and equal partnership between men and women in all decision-making policies. Two, seventh-generation decision-making to protect and honor the children of future generations. And three, modeling a deep respect for the environment through actions that affirm the sacredness of all life. Spiritual democracy, they conclude, requires our engagement. Now, this is a, a fine expression of the common good that we were discussing last week. Everyone gets included in the process if they so choose, and no one is shouted down, like at our dinner party. By looking to the seven generations, we are encouraged to think beyond our own simple wants, desires, and greeds. Unlike my dinner companions, it's only good if it serves me attitude, the seventh generation demands that we think in the longer term about the ramifications of our actions today. And implied is the acceptance that we have to make or may have to make some sacrifices or at least make do with what we have so that the generations that come can survive and thrive. And that's really more of a moral and spiritual demand than a political one. It's not political at all. Yet we live in an age when long-term political planning means looking to only towards the next election. We heard that reaffirmed last night by the new leader of the UCP party. Spirit and vision are shoved to the back of democratic values when they should most be at the forefront. Well, I told you I had no conclusion to this sermon, and I don't. I'm going to stop there and let you conclude this sermon. I'm going to turn it back to John and invite him to carry on this conversation that will bring our series on democracy to a close. So this way the people get the last word. So, a question for you to consider, a couple of questions, and then I'll pass the mic around. One of them, what does a successful democracy look like to you? Or, if you want to put it another way, what are some essential features of a successful democracy? Related to that is, how do you participate in this successful democracy that you uh, pictured? So, those are two questions. I have others if those don't go anywhere, but I think they will. Um, so, who wants to start? This is not a huge thought, but just from the experience of the civic election here, it's really important not to demonize the opponent and because then you get these very sharp divisions. And I'm just so sad about what's happening in Spain and Catalonia. You always have to know that your guy might not get elected and that's going to be okay. And he has to know he's going to be elected by some people and not elected by others, but has to serve them all. So successful democracy to you looks like don't demonize your opponents. Awesome. A successful democracy looks like a leader going down to defeat and, and that leader's party sitting down and saying, okay, what are we going to do in four years? Not contesting automatically the, the results of the election, not fighting to stay in power, not encouraging voter suppression, n none of those things. It, it, it looks like when you lose, your only thought is, how are we going to win next time? I think the answer to both of those questions is related, and it's about us. Because there is no way to successfully participate in a democracy if you have not done self-reflection if you're not willing to be engaged. But in that engagement, you have to know what you want, what you don't want, what you're willing to do, where you're willing to go in order to make a democratic space that's open for everyone. And so the foundation, I absolutely believe, of any successful democracy is us and looking inside first. I really think that... Um Democracy kind of begins with the, the family unit, with the, the parents participating and creating democracy within the family uh, so that it's passed on to the kids so that they can practice democracy as well. 
I think that's just where it starts. Just two quick things. One is around changes that can be made to actually uh, allow more, much more aggressive participation in voting, and there's a number of kind of mechanisms which I think I'd be in favor of. But just following up on Susan's comment, I do think it's important to participate in democracy, to aggressively try and understand why people who think differently than you have that opinion, not based on the fact that they are evil or or have some moral thing. I, I, I do think on both sides of the political equation, it's getting more and more entrenched that somehow all Republicans are evil, all Democrats are there, all liberals are like this, all NDP are wonderful, all conservatives are horrible. And why would someone who is really reasonable have a different opinion? And I think it's kind of intellectually shallow to enter into demonization of particular interviews rather than trying to understand it, actually. I think the questions made me think back to the presentation that Sarah did for us about three weeks ago that really centered around the degree to which everybody is enabled to participate. And whether it's participation in voting or participation in the civil society in a variety of different ways, that there are great segments of people who just are not in, enabled in any way to participate. She was particularly looking at people who um, find themselves in the low-income, homeless kinds of categories. But I think it's a broader issue than that. Somebody uh, after that session commented on what the schools could be doing. And I thought to myself afterwards, uh, schools are not examples of democracies. So until we've got a way of enabling everybody, uh, even young people who are much too young to vote, to participate and be heard, be understood, sort of related to what John was saying, be encouraged to express different ideas, to understand that there are different ideas. I think all of that is related to the two questions that John posed for us. I think just to follow up on that, my own experience is we can too easily be in our own little echo chambers where we all listen to our own, we follow our own Twitter feeds, our own social media, our own newspapers that actually echo our own thoughts. And we don't then have to listen to or want to even listen to kind of opposing views. And I mean, within families, I have a brother-in-law who is extremely conservative. And, and I want to shut off his Facebook feed. Like, I don't want to have to listen to that. Or, but a part of me goes, but how do we change each other and listen to each other if we're shutting each other out? So I think it's a real challenge to, you know, particularly in this social media world where you can, stuff is inundated on you, but to how do you not allow then others to become radicalized or you yourself to become radicalized? So I think that listening, I think, is really a part of democracy. I think one of the key issues in our current democracy is recognizing our own apathy and the way that we've allowed our democracy to be hijacked by elites. And that is what created the vacuum that put Trump into power. And to think it can't happen here or it can't happen elsewhere is delusional. The common person feels unheard. They feel unrepresented. And when that happens, you get this increased polarization and the increased, I think, willingness to only, again, like you say, sit in your own echo chamber and then vote for the guy who's lying to you who's really in it for his own good or, or her own good. And we need to weed out those types of politicians, and we can only do it through our own active participation. I don't think we actually live in a true democracy. We go to the polls. We have five candidates to choose from, and whoever gets the most in each riding is the person who wins when the majority actually voted against. <laughs> Not necessarily against that person, but for other people. So... Nobody actually seems to get a majority of votes in most writings, and that is a very flawed system. And we really, really need to change that. That's number one thought. Number two thought is we ought to be able to fire our representatives and not have to wait until the next uh, election because a lot of damage can be done and has been done by various uh, politicians remain in power 
even though the majority of people are against the policies that he or she promotes. I was almost tempted to write a, light a candle for Kenya for the democratic elections or for the elections and the upheaval that's going there because it's, I know not a whole lot, very little actually about Kenya, but very concerning to see what seems to be the collapse of a democratic situation there. I think some people are aware that there was an election that was declared invalid, I believe, by the Kenyan Supreme Court. And then the main opponent has withdrawn from the elections when the Supreme Court ordered new elections. So what does this have to do with us and businessmen that spoke kinds of political views that we don't necessarily agree with or that a person doesn't agree with. Somebody who is more right-wing, perhaps, and lives on a farm and doesn't support occupational health and safety legislation, all those different viewpoints. Well, I maintain that if we want to participate in a democracy, we need to respect other people's points of view because ultimately we are going to need some institutions that we agree on in order to have democratic elections, debate, and stay away from the sort of situation that has evolved in Kenya that I've got great fears for. Just listening to everybody's comments here, I think a real core part of democracy is freedom of speech because everybody being able to speak their, their way, people can listen and they can absorb the information. So, you know, the importance of the media, the importance of communication, can't always think that other people are going to accept our beliefs, but at least we can say them. A democracy is only as healthy as how educated the people are. I know we, we sort of talked about the media, but they play an important role in educating us on how the world works and what's going on in the world. And when you have a, a decision or a choice being able to choose something that fits your mental dialogue better than, than another one, you force yourself into a direction that, I guess, has been brought up. We sort of polarize, and we're, we're watching, especially to our neighbor to the south, how, how polarized things can get. And so it's important to, to protect our, our media and our, and our free speech. I'm going to wrap it up there. I know hopefully you will continue this conversation over coffee, and I think this has been a great month and a great theme to delve into uh, this whole topic of democracy.